everybody. Well, thanks for being here. And uh, well, I'll try to do one thing, and that, that only thing is actually keep you awake. So I know sometimes uh, talking about AI uh, gets a bit boring, and then when it comes to the bit that touches like a mathematics, then it's even worse. So let's see how it goes. There are like uh, two things to notice on this slide. The first one, well, the, the name changed. If you look at the program, so it says Relose, but then after it got published, then it was suggested to change the name. So it's now called the Sign Relu. It makes more sense. You're going to understand why in a bit. The second thing is that's actually not me. That's just the opening from Code Motion. And then I thought, well, I'm going to put all my AI knowledge into it. I'm going to fix it with like a, a mask RNN uh, neural network. And then I did it. Look. Do you see? It's perfect. So that's all my AI knowledge. But it worked out quite well. That was actually the, the, the opening slide, which then I, I just kept there. So then you have a look at what we might be looking at in a bit. So that's me. I don't know if you noticed some kind of X-Men geek, if you saw me around or some other time somewhere. So that's my son. Who can guess his name? Not all my friends can actually tell it, OK? <laughs> Yeah, it's Logan, yeah. Oh, but you probably knew it already. No, you didn't? OK, fine. Uh, well, I, I do quite a few things, uh, like in, also like in a community area, but uh, as work, and I try to have fun uh, all the time, whenever I am. So from our sponsors, uh, let's say, it's not like a sponsor. That should be like more like a joke. But then I work at QB. And uh, you might, if you don't know QB, you know Tone. So it's a smart thermostat. When, like some people who don't know it, so it doesn't come just as a box, but it has a lot of sensors that are connected, like at your home to your like uh, boiler or to your like the meter cost, I call it like the electricity thingy. So then it helps you to actually save on uh, electricity, save on gas, because it says when you are actually using something not in an efficient way. So and there's a lot of uh, traditional machine learning, but also like some deep learning behind it. So you can uh, check it out afterwards if you're interested. Just go to the booth, booth and then you can actually try out your cell phone one time that it's actually connected to, to uh, connected and working and getting like uh, measurements from the uh, devices connected to it, like lamps and that kind of stuff. So this talk, it's going to be like, I think half of it, it's more like inspirational. Uh, and the other half, we'll get more in some technical details. But before we get to this, inspirational part, like who's actually working with machine learning like traditional or deep learning over here, like in this room, yeah, some people. Who's actually like software developer or architect or system, yeah, yeah, sees admins, uh, DevOps, okay. Who's actually thinking about changing and like changing the career path, not from software or whatever to AI, but from A to B? Anyone thinking about the change? Yeah, I see one hand there. OK, so then that's the inspirational part of the talk. And uh, because that's what I did, actually. So I, well, I studied computer science. And I liked AI like the, in the past. But I didn't get a chance to use it or to work with it. But after 20 years like developing traditional software, like, uh, like mobile applications and, uh, and like web applications, like uh, just back-end systems, so it gets a bit boring because you go from like a language, like programming language paradigms. So then you have like functional programming and you have like a bit more like a, uh, <clears throat> then from there you get like object oriented as well. And so, and then languages in general. So then you don't want to just keep, at least I, I worked with Python, with Lua, with Java, and now a bit with Scala, but I just don't want to keep changing the language because for me it doesn't add that much value to my career. And that's my opinion, by the way. So with AI, <coughs> in a general sense, not talking about uh, artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence, like just AI. And so it has way more like uh, opportunities. Well, I saw more opportunities there, so you can focus on different things. So then that was the first part of my inspiration to just actually apply it and work with it on a daily basis. And you end up also like doing traditional software development because you have to offer it in some way. But then how do I get there? Like that's hard because you like 
I've talked about it in the past, I saw it in the past, but then nowadays things changed a bit, like there are like way more f things that can be done thanks to the, the volume of data that is available, thanks to the computing power that is over there, uh, <coughs> that's out there. But then how to get there? Like, I mean, you have a job, you have a family, you have cats, and it's pretty busy. So then I decided to actually uh, go to like a Coursera and then start studying over there. Uh, it's a bit tough because you have to find time for it. So I did from 2017, well, 20, yeah, 17 till Feb this year, like uh, 52 weeks of online courses on Coursera. Like it's a year, 52 weeks. I managed to do like 52 weeks. And sometimes I was doing like three weeks in one and just on holidays and weekends. It kind of, it paid off. You're going to see in a bit. So from Stanford to like, I'll go to like Toronto University, Washington, uh, Ohio State University. So that one on go is calculus because I didn't remember anything anymore about calculus. So then I did a calculus uh, course. It's ongoing because I go there and then I do like five weeks and then I stop. It's a 16 weeks course. And then I do nine weeks and then I stop. And whenever I need something like to refresh my mind, I go back there. But th those weeks doesn't, they don't count into the 52. And it was cool, it worked fine. At some point in time, my wife came to me and said, look, you actually like learning a lot about this, but for some other things, like simpler things, it's kind of becoming a bit dumber. <laughs> it's, uh, which could be true, but uh, it was like a lot of information to process and like uh, not that much actually to do with it. So then that, that's when I said, well, now I can just like uh, go and start looking uh, in the market for, for another job. <clears throat> from uh, what I took from these, uh, all those weeks and uh, all those uh, professors, like actual like university professors, and uh, you know some of them probably from the pictures I, I showed before, but then I would say that learning from the best, so I took those, the three people and the other, like the, the first three and then the other two guys in the picture, so as, uh, as an example, like they actually, they taught me a lot more in a way that they, how they delivered the message, how they bring it they brought it up to me. So Andrew Wynn and uh, Adrienne and uh, Rajesh, so they're like excellent uh, professors. And uh, Herbo and Wiesel, they more because what they did in the 50s and 60s. <coughs> Sorry, to start with, for example, that's uh, an experiment that they did with cats in 59. And what they were studying was, uh, well, how uh, like an animal see, how is the visual cortex working? So it was like more neuroscience. And uh, so that's the course I did with Adrienne and Rajesh. And they, they got cats and they just put a projector in front of them, like an image being projected, like a geometric forms. And the visual cortex was connected to electrodes and uh, they wanted to just see when, what was going to actually cause a spike, what kind of st uh, stimuli was going to cause a spike on the, on the visual cortex, on the neurons of the cats. It didn't work till 59 because they had these uh, geometric forms. And then at some point in time, they, they noticed that, well, wait, it's working now. When they're like moving the, the, the picture, the image, like in the projector, so it was working because it was a bit tilted. So then they had this very thin diagonal line from the paper, actually, from the, 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 the sheet that they had there. And when this line was passing in the, on the projector, so it, the neuron was spiking. And then, well, hey, wait, it doesn't work with geometric forms because the cortex is actually understanding like just the edge. And then they change it all and they went for this. And like for those doing like uh, neural networks, that's quite similar to what we see like in the first layer of a neural network, edge. And then you get like to more complex cells and then you have like a like kind of shapes and then to like, complex cells, cells or layers in the case of neural networks and then to more complex layers and then you have like actually a and a part of the image, and then you get to the complete image. And so that's how it learns, and that's how uh, our visual cortex works along with the retina. So what they, the experiment they're doing is you have uh, the noise over there, so the image that we're collecting. So this image get through this first uh, pair of cells, let's say, like the uh, lateral geniculate uh, nucleus, like they have like very simple cells, and then they ca actually they get oriented in a way that can converge towards a V1 cell, which is a bit more complex. And then from there, it goes up into the, the, the cortex. And there, 
there is a nonlinearity which actually is used to filter like uh, some information out of the noise. And that's where I actually went to work on, because one thing that Andrew, Andrew Wynn, he, who has done like one of his courses on Coursera? Okay, so then you guys can agree with me. He, he finished the course and he says, oh, now you know more about uh, machine learning than X percent of people walking around in Silicon Valley. And then he also said, uh, but uh, you're not, we're not expecting you to go then and, uh, well, what, uh, create a new activation function. And then I was like, well, challenge accepted. Why not? I mean, why just be one of 80% or whatever from Silicon Valley if we can do something else, something different? And then I started thinking about, well, creating an activation function. So that's more or less how, like, to get to explain it very shortly, we have like a very simple like a neural network there. It's slightly deep, so it's not that deep. It has like two hidden layers. So there's other people say, well, there's not, nothing such as a deep learning. It's just machine learning and you have lots of layers. Some other people say, yeah, if you have at least three, then you can call it deep because yeah, it's deep, it's three, <laughs> whatever. We're not going to discuss these things here. But then what happens is you get input. So the input is like an image, let's say. So, and then that, for example, if you compare with the traditional machine learning, the features, like if you're gonna do like a regression on house prices, then you're gonna have like some features of the houses. So then like a, how many rooms, square meters, etc. So that you have to do manually. With a represent, representational uh, learning, like in neural networks, that's done automatically from raw data. So then it just gets raw data and it learns from there. Okay, you have the input, those axes, and then you have weights. And the weights, they are like initialized using like some algorithms. And inputs times the weights plus a bias, and then you get the sum of it. So that's linear. That's a linear function over there. And that linear, the, the, the output of this linear function is actually the input for the activation function. And then from the activation function, uh, <coughs> it's going to be used to the output function that's going to, for example, is Optimax. And then you get like, well, this should be like a cat or a dog, whatever. So this non-linearity, in the activation function, it does the filtering of the best features out of the blob that you got of data. And we have like three of them here, as you can see. So most used nowadays is the Re uh, ReLU, rectified the linear unit. Sigmoid is no, no longer used, like uh, the green one, and the ton H. Okay, fine, it's there. So everybody's using ReLU, it's, it works, it's, it's great. So why to come with another one? Like, uh, why to improve on things? Because we want things to get better. So then why not just to try out? If you fail, you keep trying, then perhaps you look at something else. So, but what's there to be fixed? For example, the sigmoid, which is no longer used. Uh, well, not that much. In some cases, yes, like you might have seen yesterday in a few talks. Uh, it has a problem, like with vanishing and exploding gra uh, gradients. I will explain, like, the problems in a bit. <laughs> the turn H has, it suffers from the same problem. And uh, the ReLU, it has this dying ReLU effect because what it does is when you update, the, when you initialize the weights, whatever that it's below zero, it kills. So then it means that the neurons won't get activated because the linear function does what? Matrix multiplication. If you multiply by zero, you get shit out of it. Uh, or nothing. <laughs> And uh, leaky ReLU, it's a function that actually tries to fix it because it applies a factor, so then it multipli multiplies by x instead of just cutting it, whatever, x like less than zero. But it works okay, it doesn't work, like it's not better than the ReLU, and then it's not really, really used. It's like it's close to it. Uh, so then people just stick to ReLU because, well, it's slightly better than leaky, leaky ReLU, why should I change like all the models and get like nothing back? The problem is, for example, with the sigmoid, and the turn H has actually the same issue. So if you like just sloppy <laughs> with initializing the weights, you can get like to like the, the, the your nonlinearity in that case, in that case, the sigmoid, it saturates. So, and also the derivative, so there is something which is like back propagation. So on a neural network, you move forward, you do the linearity, you get into the activation function output, and then you come back calculating the derivative. And that derivative, which is the change of that the function that the, the values uh, uh, suffered, they're going to be used to update the weights. And then it keeps going. And then it does it like for many epochs. 
until you get leg two and nice accuracy, whatever, whenever you want to stop. So on this backdrop, what happens is that the sigmoid and also the relu, they have like those dead areas. So they're like just zero. So again, it's zero. So then if it's zero, what happens? The weights don't get updated. So then you have like weights that are just dead. So, and by that, I mean the neurons, they are, they're gonna be dead. So then, then they don't do anything. And then I came up with this. And like, if it's not true, it's very well conceived. So I'm not really like trying to, to say that, well, it could be fake, no, it's not, like, it works, but I took it from uh, Giordano Bruno for the Italian uh, girls from uh, Code Motion. Like, my Italian is like, se no è vero è molto ben trovato. Any could say it better. <laughs> A friend of mine who's sitting somewhere there. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Giordano Bruno, he was a mathematician, a philosopher in Italy. He was, yeah, unfortunately, like, uh, killed by, by the Inquisition because he had a dream, and he dreamed about how the universe is organized. He came up with the idea, he wrote it down, and then he said that, because, I mean, it might not be true, but it's very well conceived. He said that, well, stars, they are just like suns, and they are like planet, planets orbiting the suns, those suns, those stars, and then people say, yeah, heresy, kill him. So, when I was, it was more or less like that, I'm just summing it up. So when I, I was getting to the IBM AI XPRIZE competition, so I submitted the idea, but I had no idea how I was going to work with it. Two weeks before the, the final date, like to send the, the technical report, I dreamed with, about this. And then I, oh, just like Giordano Bruno, yeah. If I believe in reincarnation, perhaps I'm Giordano Bruno, who knows? But no, I'm not. <laughs> so then I believed that, uh, and who came to my mind was Adrienne Ferhoff from Washington University because when she was explaining like how the brain works, she was like, oh, well, nobody knows how it works, so that's why we don't have like a artificial general intelligence or super intelligence, we just don't know. But then she said, perhaps we just need a bit of uncertainty. And then, so I went into this dream thinking about uncertainty, and I thought, yeah, why, like to, why does it have to be zero? Or why does it have to be minus one? Why we just go around and perhaps it's gonna work, so let's see, but what can I use for that? Well, I can use like a sign, but then there's a problem the derivative of a sign is zero over one, which is zero, so then it would be dead on the backdrop if I get zero on the weights uh, during the intelligence. And then, yeah, but the, the, the derivative of uh, cosine, co cosine is sine. And then, uh, that's a nice meme, but I didn't do that in back in my days. <laughs> uh, then I got this. And then it's one. So then with my function, it's never zero. And I think that's why it works, because uh, oh, you cannot see it, oh sorry, I shouldn't have made. Well, <coughs> I did some, uh, of course, I run it, I went like uh, to like Keras and I put the function there and then I start running like uh, with uh, CNNs, with uh, deep nets, on uh, images, on text, and, and then you have to do it a lot. And for example, if you're not working on it, how are you gonna do it, when are you gonna do it? It takes time. So I also did it with ResNet, for those who know about it. So I was running it on this, on another MacBook from another company, and it was running for like, well, for small things, like uh, 50 epochs, five minutes or 10 minutes, and then for like big uh, like networks, more complex, like just Lenet, Lenet 5 was like uh, five hours. And then I, okay, so why not? just try something bigger, and then like uh, eight layers, eight convolutional layers uh, network, or then it took me like uh, 13 hours to run it, so then the MacBook was like all the night, like a but it was working. And then at some point in time I said, wow, that's a waste, I'm, I should do it on Amazon. So then I automated everything with Terraform, so that's the nice part about knowing a bit of software and a bit of like, a, like a, those tools, like DevOps, let's say like this. Then I put it on Amazon, and then I was like burning a lot of money, and then I calculated, okay, so I, if I do like just a bit, it's cheaper than burning electricity at my place, but then it was a bit like unsustainable, so then I went back to the laptop, uh, to the MacBook, and, uh, but some, some stuff took more than 20 hours to run, like ResNet, for example, and some other networks, like AlexNet, it doesn't run on the MacBook because it doesn't have enough resources. But like this is just a glimpse of uh, like uh, on a deep network, and 
Yeah, you can, uh, well, you cannot see, but I have the numbers in the next slide. So it's better in some cases. I also did it, I run it a lot of times to see like uh, when it's better, like, like the, 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 the ratio, like if you run it like a 10, 20 times, when it's actually like uh, above uh, ReLU and when ReLU actually wins, because it's, yeah, sometimes it, it gets a slightly better the ReLU. But then, uh, on machine learning problems, when you are able to get like zero, like to get to 99% on a slightly advanced network, uh, it's quite easy. And depending, of course, on the data you have. But if you want to go over it, so then it, it takes, it, it takes uh, like a lot of work. And then, for example, with traditional machine learning, you have to put some time on like a feature en engineering, like a extracting features to features to actually increase accuracy. And then over here, you have to go over models and over like hyperparameters. And that's uh, like a problem nowadays in the, in the in the industry. Like someone oh, writing papers is awesome, but then last year there was a research done on top of 400 papers. Like 3% of them actually gave away a model or gave away a pseudocode or gave away like some formulas. Sometimes companies and universities, they're just closing it because they do have the rights on top of it. And then the scariest thing is that other universities, companies trying to repli reproduce it, they can't. So then it's like, that's not science. <laughs> so that's tricky. And then what happens is someone goes there, takes uh, the paper and then the model it has and then just runs it and then it works. But then there is no like knowledge in terms of well, but how? And if I want to change the model, and then if I want to change the parameters, so how should I do it? How should it work? So lots of people doing it, they just don't know. They just get from the internet and they use it. So that's why it was important to go over like uh, all the Coursera stuff and then actually learn how it is, because to be able to increase it, as you can see, like uh, in the CNN with MNIST, MNIST is like uh, digits, like handwritten digits. It went from 99.39 to 99.50, and you say, ah, come on, that's like nothing. But that's very important. Like if a company wants, well, if anyone wants to actually have something that can perform better and then sell it as a problem. So that's like in machine learning, that's deep learning, that's really important, like just this fraction. And in some other cases, like with IMDB, uh, it also performs like slightly better. There was one, there is one thing that I, I don't think it's here. No. Oh yeah, you cannot see, but it's slightly slower than, than the ReLU. For example, this is just MNIST on a deep net with three hidden layers, like not that deep. Uh, on the real ReLU, which is the, the blue one, it took like five minutes and 50, 52 seconds to run. On the sign ReLU, it took like seven minutes and 43. And we can see here that the loss, like it's actually lower on the, on the sign ReLU. On the leaky ReLU, it took seven minutes and 13. So then the leaky ReLU, it's like, it doesn't perform as good as ReLU and it's slower. So that's why also it's not really used, not that much. And when you go up, so then you see like the same time there. Oh well. uh, <coughs> so then it's slightly slower. And why is that? Because, well, the ReLU, it comes back, whatever is zero, it just gives it, so it doesn't do any computation on top of it. But then I do computation on top of it, it has to calculate the deriv derivative of the sine and cosine, so then it, it slows it down a bit. But then you have some improvement in terms of accuracy. And also, for example, uh, the IMDB uh, data set is based on the, like, the reviews on IMDB, so it's more like a sentiment analysis. So that's another thing. When you come up with like a, a new algorithm function or whatever, so you have to make sure that it generalizes because it, it would be awesome. Like uh, I know people who said, no, I've, I've created some activation functions as, as well, but it works only on this problem I have. So it doesn't work in anything else. So then it's not really a contribution to, to, to the industry and the academia. Oh, it's fine? <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, and uh, so it also works with text. And if you say, well, but where can I find it? Like if I want to use it now. So it's another cool thing. So it's now on Keras. It's not on Keras, Keras it's on Keras Contrib. So it's, uh, it has been made as a contribution. And uh, 
what has to happen now, it has to become popular. Like, uh, it would be nice if you guys go back home and then you open up your MacBooks, uh, laptops, whatever, and then you just start running models on it and then publishing stuff on Twitter because then uh, if it becomes popular, it goes to Keras. But of course, if it's on Keras Contrib, you can like, easily install it and use it, like just create Keras models or you can just like, get a model from, like a well-known model from uh, GitHub, whatever, and then just change it from ReLU to sign ReLU in the Keras documentation, I added like all the information that's needed, like uh, how the function works, and also like the hyperparameter it has. It has one parameter that actually controls the amplitude of the of the sinusoidal curve. So that parameter you can just fine tune it. For example, for a deep net, it's it it's better to use, if I remember correctly, like a 0 0.0025, something like that. And for a CNN, it's, it's slightly different, but then this is all in the documentation. Another important fact that I mentioned, well, it's a bit slower. It is, uh, well, it's seven minutes or something to run like on this model. But then, that's because last week I changed it. It used to be like way slower. So then just like last week I was working on the presentation, I was like, yeah, that's not good. Like I can probably achieve something similar. Like I can have the same, uh, uh, like a curve going on whenever things are like lower than zero by changing here and there and then that's so why I changed the function like just one week before code motion and then I got like a, it used to take like for example on this that network like nine minutes and now it's uh, way uh, faster and the code on Keras is actually the old version which is also fine but this one I'm going to just create a pull request and get it out there but then so far, okay, so who's interested? No, they're not put, putting it on the missiles or <laughs> like uh, fight jets. No, I, got a pro I was approached by uh, a guy from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. I forgot his name. He's, uh, he finished his PhD and then he's doing some research at NATO at the, in Italy at the, the Center of Maritime and Research and Experiments. And he was actually studying like uh, the dying relu effect and he just stumbled on uh, on my function and and okay so he sent me an email look i want to plot the graph of the function so the graph you guys see before saw before and so how does it work and then so we're like talking and he said i'm doing like a uh, research and then i want to actually compare it with your function and so that's cool so if he actually gets to publish something that would be nice because then the function becomes a bit more popular and then probably you're gonna see it out there somewhere uh, and I'm going to show some code as well. And like going a bit back to the inspirational part, it took a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of effort, like waking up. I mean, it's, uh, I asked who wants to change from A to B because, I mean, it's only like a mindset, you know, like you just need to focus on something. So then I like f during one year, like I, most of the days I was waking up like half past five, studying until seven, preparing the like the food for my kids so they could go to school, going to work, come back, studying for another for some time, going to sleep and like one year holidays, weekends, who cares? Uh, and that like uh, not in the academia, so that's very hard. Why? I I submitted a paper for the ACM conference in it was in in France uh, back in April. Uh, of course, they didn't accept it. I got one guy, one professor, I don't know who because it's anonymous, like he gave me a huge feedback, quite nice, which I took when I prepared the presentation. Uh, but the rest, there was, there were like, there was uh, comments, there were comments like, uh, who are you? Or, yes, but who's behind this? Which institution? Uh, which company? And it's like, you cannot do anything. I mean, it's like, okay, I don't know you, like, I, I go away. Uh, not in the industry, I mean, not working for Google, Facebook, or whatever, like the, the big four or five, or Apple, or Uber, like, not that, not really applying AI on a daily basis. Also, not in a startup doing it. Like, there are, like, lots of startups, of course, just calling uh, Google APIs, uh, just calling Amazon, whatever, like, uh, Google Cloud Advocates. But I was not doing that as well. And, but I didn't give up, and so that's, the, the end of the inspira inspirational part, like, don't give up because it only depends on you. Like, uh, like anyone can do it. From whatever you can think to, to whatever you want to do. So, 
There is no, nothing is stopping you. And now I'm a machine learning engineer at QB. So they went there, they, okay, yeah, fine, yeah, you, like, I mean, you have purpose in life. <laughs> Let's put it like that now. But it worked out. So then, so nowadays I'm pretty happy with what I do. Like, uh, just doing software was quite boring. It's like for me, after some time. So I don't know how it is with your guys, but. Some references, like, uh, like the Hubble paper, Hubble and Visual paper from uh, 61, after the work they've done with, uh, with the cats, so then they published papers up to 64. And uh, they, like in this paper, they have way more interesting images of the hierarchy in the cortex, how it all works. If you look at it, you're gonna see like neural networks everywhere. So it's pretty cool. Like some uh, back prop stuff you should read if you want to get more into it, uh, from Andrei Carpati from Tesla, he's a director of AI at Tesla, well known in the, in the industry, in the academia as well, he's a professor at uh, Stanford. Keras uh, Contrib, so the function is there. And I have this, uh, de de it's a deep learning in Keras uh, repository on GitHub. All the stuff I do, like, uh, it's all there, like, with, like, well, everything, lots of things I do, like, um, I did, like, studying. I also did, like, lots of O'Reilly's, uh, the Safari online uh, courses on O'Reilly's, because they're, like, shorter, so you can start there, because then they, they have, like, a glimpse on the math part of it, and it's, like, six hours courses, sometimes five hours, so then you can do it quickly, so you have an idea how it works, and then you can deep dive into, like, those uh, five, eight, 16 weeks uh, courses on Coursera. So that's what I did, like, get an idea and then deep dive, like always deep dive. Like it's, it's important to understand how things work under the hood. Otherwise, problems will come back like later and then bite you. Before questions, let me just uh, run one thing here. Uh, like I just put, this is, uh, oh, this is not the Keras code, so I just, and it's also not a ne neural network. What I put together was just like simulating like a two layers and then calculating the weights, like initializing them with a Xavier Glorot initialization there. And uh, just like a plotting, the fun plotting like a, some noise, which is actually not noise, it's from a real image. I just put it like very small, otherwise we'd have like a huge matrix running here. And uh, just a simple image, some weights, and, uh, and plotting like the graph of the input, the activation function, and the output, so for both like a sign relu and relu. So now I need my glasses, otherwise it's gonna be complicated. Oh. So you look at it, you say, yeah, but that's the same, right? Or oh, that's the image there, and then you have the, the activation function in the middle and the output, and you say, yeah, it's the same. Come on, you're like fooling us with this idea. So, of course, if we look closer here at the sign relu, I can, I can go closer just a little bit. So, it's zero, right? When we look, like, slightly closer here, and it's not zero, it's very close to zero, but it's not zero. See here? This one. You guys can see, right? <laughs> yeah, so then that's a slight difference, but then it does some computation, it becomes a bit slower, but at least for the many times I run it, so then most of the time it, wor it performs better than, than the ReLU. You know, like it's undeterministic, so sometimes I, I have it like a, in a, This is the last run I had, but I run it like some, like few times and I keep like track of it, like, and track of the real, ReLU. See, like I'm, I get it to like 59, the last two digits, and I play around with parameters, and the ReLU got like max to 51. So then it's like, for example, if you do have the computation power, so when you do like deep learning, is you don't run it like just for, 300 epochs, you, you run for three, uh, uh, 300 epochs several times. And then you take the best out of it, or you do like a, a weight average uh, things, and 
questions. We have five minutes. There is one over there. No, no, uh, yeah. Oh, you, oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just have probably one question. Uh, what kind of data sets that you were... Uh, I, used, I used the uh, uh, MNIST. So MNIST was uh, created by Ian LeCun in 98. It's a handwritten digit, so they have All like right. six... Okay. And uh, IMDB right. data set, yeah. which is, uh, was from 2015, so they have like uh, 50,000 uh, film reviews from IMDB. But I also did for, with Kaggle, Toxicity was a Google challenge. Uh, you can look it, I have it on uh, my GitHub repository. And uh, Kaggle, oh, it's like uh, one and a half million uh, uh, Wikipedia reviews. They want to uh, identify uh, uh, toxic comments on the internet. So it's a problem that Google is trying right. to solve. Okay, so yeah. it's a sentiment analysis, handwriting, and recognition, yeah. Yeah. and categorization? Uh, toxicity. Classification? Uh, no? Classification is on the, on the handwritten it right. classification. It has 10 classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also applied it with what was, uh, the Gutenberg data set on books. Okay. You no, know, with word to vector, so then having one embed layer. So, but then I tried it with uh, LSTMs. So LSTMs, the internal gates, they use uh, TUN H. They don't use ReLU because TUN H for LSTMs is better. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is one, once you, you flatten it out to a full connected layer, then you can put it there. So then it, it also it performs better. And one thing I forgot to mention, with IMDB, I run, well, like textual data, it's a bit more tricky to train. So I ran it only for like for 10 epochs. So with ReLU, after the fourth epoch, it overfeeds. So then the weights, they go crazy during training, and it gets like 100% accuracy. And with the signing ReLU, I can run it for 10 epochs in a row, and it doesn't overfit. Yeah. Oh, he, he was first, and then I'll go to him. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah, That's cheers. The nice. uh, question is, on the performances you showed um, with um, IMDb and uh, MNIST, uh, is there any case where you found that uh, the, the sign ReLU didn't outperform uh, ReLU? Yeah, there's, there are a few cases. So it's undeterministic, but then like, uh, for example, if you look at the, the last uh, data I showed, so then some, when I get, have a run and then I get like a 99.49, and then ReLU gives a 0 .50, 99.51. So then, but then I can get it, uh, you play around with the, the learning parameter, uh, with the epsilon, I called it, and then you can get it like way, way up than uh, than the relu. But then again, it's like you have to go there, and then you have to fine tune something. So then it depends on what you want, like what you want to achieve. For example, it could probably like be better for competitions because you want to increase it a lot. Right. But for a company, I, well, a company could be happy with 99%, uh, and you don't have to fine tune anything. You just run it with relu, then it's fine. But uh, with a co like I ran Lenet five with uh, the sign relu on the MNIST competition on, on uh, Kaggle, and I'm on, I have to submit it every two months, but now I think I'm like number 112 with the simplest model ever. And uh, because you know, like on Kaggle, people just, they do like ensemble and that kind of stuff to, to get to the top. Uh, yeah, so I was interested if you have perhaps any benchmarks with the ELU. Uh, ELU is known to outperform ELU almost consistently. So Which one? Uh, exponential linear unit. No, I didn't try, no. I didn't try that one. It's, it's, it, it's like I went just for ReLU and Leaky ReLU, more because, well, that's the one that is actually most used nowadays, ReLU, and then Leaky ReLU, there are people here and they're using it. But uh, there is also like, a, I think, Swift, which is on Keras Contrib as well. Yeah. But uh, when you, it, it way, it's way more like a complex than ReLU and even the sign ReLU because it has way more computation. So then probably it's going to be slower, but I didn't test it to check its performance. So that's why it would be nice if people just look around and try to, to run it. For example, if you have like more resources. Now I do have the resources, but I also like doing it on a daily basis. So then it's slightly less time because I can practice what I want like at work. I don't have to wake up at 5.30. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> So, um, 
in, I think it was a talk yesterday here uh, about uh, the com comparing frameworks for uh, deep learning. And uh, based on um, stars on GitHub and so on, there was uh, TensorFlow was clearly the winner. Yeah. So uh, my question would be like, do you have any intention to port uh, the sign relu to TensorFlow? Uh, yes, I do. Like, uh, I want to first to put it on Py PyTorch. Like, PyTorch, PyTorch is, uh, is slightly simpler than Tens TensorFlow. And uh, so I started looking into it to just get it there. I looked into TensorFlow, and, and uh, they do have, which was weird, like, uh, and so I, ha I want to understand it a bit better, but they do have, because like, for example, Keras is a meta framework, and then it uses TensorFlow as a backend, or, or Microsoft Cognitive Tick, whatever. But then if you look at the TensorFlow source, they do have a section where they import like uh, dependencies from Keras. So then I was like, okay, so if they do this, so probably they could use it once it reached Keras. Mm. And also, for example, if you have it on Keras, which improves like uh, productivity, mm. uh, and if we get it on Keras itself, so then it's easier for people to just use it because you have it on, uh, on the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, mm. MXNet, which is getting there, and also like a TensorFlow. I'm just uh, wondering yeah. for people that have uh, already models, that could just uh, swap the relus to sign relu as experiment. I, I, I don't. I haven't got any feedback except for this guy from NATO. But right. uh, I hope that if he publishes something, so probably it's going to increase it. Thanks. Oh no, yeah, let's see. Okay. Because the sign uh, relu that uh, Wilder does is not that a tricky uh, function, so you can actually do. And on a uh, TensorFlow, you can define activation functions on the lower level by putting the mathematical uh, f uh, things there. So since it's not that uh, tricky, you can manually try out on, a t on, the, on the TensorFlow. Yeah, okay. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>